The parent-child is a really, really awful place to be in because the parent-child is robbed of their childhood while simultaneously praised praise for that robbing. You shouldn't feel free to leave. They're your fucking children. I'm not okay with it and I don't care if I never can get over it. And this has been going on since I was fucking seven years old. Not free! And a lot of these kids don't realize how awful that experience was for them, how much it stole from them, until they're past their childhood, until they're old enough to look back and be like, wait, that wasn't appropriate. You're probably wondering why I'm covering the Thorps today. A um, couple of reasons. As I've said before, I cover drama or drama adjacent content. Uh, if I think that it has some sort of like a uh, greater thing that we can pull from it, or if it has like psychologically relevant uh, points of uh, talking about basically. Um, I suspect as we get into it, it will be self-evident which of those two categories it falls into. It might fall into both. Um, I'm also going to be borrowing from uh, DGG uh, poster Black Trinity. So uh, what I'm doing is I'm going through his post. So all of the credit for all the work of this stream goes to Black Trinity first and foremost, but a bunch of people in the comments were asking somebody to review this, and I've been interested in looking in depth into the Thorps for some time now. Um, so when I saw this post, I was just gonna go through it by myself. Um, and then people were asking for it to be gone over stream. I thought about it, and here we are. Define Thorps, I've never heard of it. So the Thorps are a family. They are a family in the Twitch and YouTube space uh, that are recently getting uh, some notoriety. Uh, they've been on stream with Destiny and a bunch of like kind of other bigger names. I'm not sure where else they've been. Um, and seem pretty actively looking for internet fame. So I'm sure a lot of you know who they are. They are a Catholic family. I believe there are six children. Um, ben and Grace are the main two that you see on the internet, although I believe the mother has been on the internet as well, like streaming with them. Um, uh, Grace is the oldest child. Uh, ben is the father, and there is a mother as well. However, my understanding is that she has left the house. So here's what this stream is and what it is not. This is going to be a in-depth look into Grace Thorpe and the Thorpe family as presented by Black Trinity. Uh, I will do my best to put up the Reddit on stream so that you can tell what I'm reading versus what's going to be my opinion. Um, also, just like I said with Steven Crowder, three minutes is not enough to determine the nature of a relationship. Black Trinity has looked through about 29 hours of the relationship. And while Ben and his wife's marriage has been like some number of years. Um, there's not much I can comment about people's private lives past when the screen ends. What we can talk about instead is, at least what I'm personally interested in, is what they present to the internet. That's kind of the only thing that I'm ever comfortable commenting on. I believe Black Trinity does make multiple comments about things that they think is possibly going on off stream. I'm going to read their opinion. That doesn't mean that it's my opinion, okay? Um, any other caveats I'll probably put before the section that I think is needed um, because it's probably better to have the necessary caveats before the necessary sections. All right. First matter of order, will you platform them? I'm not sure. Um, probably not, but I don't view platforming as this like moral thing all the time. Um, I probably won't for much more neutral reasons. And I think most people choose to or to not platform for mostly neutral reasons. Uh, I think people like moralizing this stuff is, especially like a lot of streamers, it's not all, but a lot of streamers make their platforming decisions based on income at the end of the day. Uh, I don't because I'm a dumb and I don't like to make money. And I regularly choose to not platform things because of my own personal decisions uh, that end up screwing me monetarily. And that's fine. Um, yeah. They're definitely going to show up to try to get on. True. So let's get into it. I'm going to just read this to you. And then we'll go through the related clips. When I, I will try to kind of switch between... Okay. This means that I'm probably reading from it. These things that I'm stating are explicitly coming from here. I will do my best to go here when it is my opinion. 
Okay, that way you can tell the difference between Black Trinity and me, because just because Black Trinity wrote it doesn't mean that I'm going to agree necessarily. Any attention toward them is all bad. Um, that is probably true for 65% of social media personalities, to be clear. Uh, yes, correct. All right. But the problem is, just because something is bad doesn't make it morally bad, right? Something could be functionally bad or harmful and not morally bad or harmful. All right. Um, from this point on, if people keep trying to moralize in the comments or sections, I will probably just choose to ignore it. Um, yeah, I, I can't keep circling the drain on that. All right. An in-depth look into Grace Thorpe. I DGG post by Black Trinity three days ago. There's been a lot of back and forth related to this whole Thorpe family business. I've seen people like Chud Logic and Zonya say that these people don't actually believe the things that they argue for and are just trying to get clout and clicks by making outlandish statements. I'm going to be clear, I've never personally felt that way. Uh, they make a lot of pretty consistent Catholic statements and arguments, particularly about relationships. They're super traditional Catholic, um, but a lot of it falls in line with things that I've been exposed to in Catholic spaces. Uh, I've never believed that they don't believe what they're saying. I believe that they've leaned into hyperbole and might be a toxic family, personally. Short answer. Unfortunately, this isn't actually the case. Yes, Ben Thorpe is 100% hungry for clout, but they are not 100% they are 100 not putting on a performance. With a clip. All right. This is a snap from i'm assuming the discord uh the ben thorpe discord i'm f***ing things up with my dad he said that we could maybe relax and watch some vids about the stephen crowder situation and get to know the whole story more but i do this thing where i pretend i'm afraid of him and i start choking on my words and stuff and acting skittish it comes in waves always worse in the mornings even though this morning wasn't even that bad i don't actively choose to be afraid of him but i'm saying to myself the whole time i'm acting afraid just calm down just relax this is a pattern from mom he's your friend he wants you to succeed which is true i know it but whatever i'm not sure what it means that sometimes i can't i just can't relax maybe it's a bad habit that'll go away i can't believe that it means i have to talk to my mother but that's what i always come back to because she taught me to be afraid of him i just try to get in a place where i can't come down and then i keep getting more and more agitated and even when i try to calm down it makes me more agitated that i'm not calm i think i need to manage myself better i think god is working in mystical ways in my life why can't i just relax and let him do that any thoughts all right. Um, that clip obviously alone isn't enough to know whether or not any of this is a performance. The fact that she added here could in self, itself be a performance. They could be leaning into using their Discord to basically create drama, obviously. Um, it's also, here's, here's the big issue. I've said this with Amber Heard. I said this with Steven Crowder. I've said this with a whole bunch of situations is that if somebody is acting like a scared of them or somebody who's got trauma and somebody who does have trauma, if the actor's good, they look the same. And so saying they're clearly acting or they're clearly not is really hard to tell, particularly from a screen, which is why to be clear, my position will be privately. I still don't know what's going on. Okay. Ever since Grace first appeared on Destiny's stream to debate him about Crowder, I've been f falling faster and faster down the Thorpe family rabbit hole on YouTube. After going through approximately 29 hours worth of VODs, I can say with absolute certainty that even though some of the clips from their streams look sensational, almost all of their family interactions are also peppered with other forms of very casual and less flashy instances of emotional and psychological abuse. And because I was so, I wasted so much of my life sifting through all the sh**, I felt the need to write this long schizo post in a desperate attempt to give some justification for me willingly putting myself through so much self-harm note all the links are streamable links as i would prefer not to directly link to ben's channel and give him more views grace replacing her mother remember this is black trinity's view if this page is pulled up it is not my opinion all right Is 
It should really be pretty clear to anyone that's seen Grace on stream that she has major issues with her mother, Courtney Thorpe. So this is probably a good starting point. A lot of people claim that Courtney is a both Grace's father, Ben Thorpe, and Grace herself. This is a completely understandable conclusion to come to if you've seen any of their interactions with Courtney, but that alone doesn't capture the full picture. The Thorpes are a Catholic family with six children who are all homeschooled to some extent. Grace is the eldest child at 20 years old, and the youngest child is 10 years old. Grace has talked about how her mother neglected her and her siblings, which forced Grace at around the age of seven or eight to have to take the, up the role of the second mom while she was supposed to be homeschooled. This led to Grace developing a lot of resentment towards her, mother's, her mother over the years, but everything started to boil over in the beginning of March 2023, when Courtney decided she was going to leave the family and start a new life. On March 24th, 2023, Grace starts a live stream where she is clearly having an emotional breakdown. I'll say this first, the language here of clearly having an emotional breakdown has already set the well. Remember, what is real and what is not real, if somebody is compelling, is going to be really hard to tell apart. I'm sick of my role in this family. I am sick of my role in the Thorpe family. <sighs> Yesterday, my dad was talking to my mom, who has decided that she is going Tossing a coin to my Twitcher. Thank you. To um, run off and start her own life. And I am not okay with that. I'm not okay with it. I'm not okay with it. And I don't care if I never can get over it. My mother is 50 years old and she's living in a hotel and she's saying she's going to start her own life. I am not okay with that. I'm not okay with being the new mother of this family. This has been going on since I was f***ing seven years old. My mother has said, I'm having problems. I need you to hold down the fort. I have not been allowed to have friends, live my own life. I, I went to school. I, I left school. I left. I dropped out of high school because mommy was having problems. I wasn't allowed to pursue my own things. I've never been allowed to have my f***ing own f***ing personality because of this family and always them saying it's i mean it's been her but like everybody's saying like you're not free you're not free to make your own decisions you're not free to do what you want to do because you have to do what's best for this family you have to do the restaurant because that's what's best for this family you can't go out with your friends you can't go get a job you because i now i'm in this position where i cannot free i'm sick So I'm going to talk broadly about the concepts that are pretty self-evident there. I'm not going to say whether or not this is literally happening in their relationship because it's really hard to say from just online stuff. This is very akin to um, in therapy. So I'm going to use like really therapy kind of clinicallys type language. We'll talk a lot about children who become parents, right? So the, the, the parent child. The parent child is a really really awful place to be in because the parent child is robbed of their childhood while simultaneously pray, praised for that robbing. And a lot of these kids don't realize how awful that experience was for them, how much it stole from them until they're past their childhood, until they're old enough to look back and be like, wait, that wasn't appropriate for an eight-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 14-year-old to have to be dealing with. I should have been dealing with 14-year-old problems, not 47-year-old problems. And because I was dealing with 47-year-old problems at 14, I didn't get to experience the 14-year-old life, the 14-year-old experience that all of my peers do. And so this is often called the parent-child um, dynamic, where the child becomes the parent to the rest of the family. Um, and what often occurs in these situations is the child who becomes the parent to the rest of the family can sometimes also become almost like spousified. So I don't mean sexually necessarily. In, in clinicalese, what we're talking about is a parent is a child who becomes more of like an emotional equal to the other parent because they're parenting all of the other children with the one parent that's left over because the other parent's kind of emotionally vacant or not there. Um, they also become like kind of the emo emotional um, caretakers and supporters 
of the parent left. So this is going to be really common, a really common dynamic that we see this. I'm going to use um, different genders so that I emphasize the point. Um, a mom whose dad, the dad works 60, 70 plus hours a week. And when he comes home, he's emotionally turned off. And the mom who works 40 hours a week has everything to do in the domestic lifestyle and she is exhausted. So by the time the oldest child turns 10, the mom is relying on that 10 year old to help her with the other kids. Say there's four other kids, right? So now the 10 year old is in a parent role, but then the mom, say the 10 year old is uh, a girl, a little girl, but then the mom and the, and the little girl start parenting together. You know, the mom will be like, Hey, you no, know, Lacey, can you go and do this? Can you go take the kids here? Can you go cook food for your little brother? Right. And they start doing, can you, can you parent, can you babysit the kids? But then what also happens is that the mom sometimes will start talking to the child the exhausted parent who's, who's still present and venting to that child as well. These are all the problems going on. This is what's going on. So they'll start venting to the child like they're the spouse who should be co-parenting with them because the other co-parent isn't emotionally present. So I'm not saying what's occurring in this situation, but this is like very adjacent to what's going on. This is kind of like the ideas that are being brought up about this is uh, spousified or uh, parentified children. I'm not saying that it is literally what's happened to grace or not but what grace is describing here is the experience of at minimum a parentified child a child who's being required to caretake the other children um because one or both of the parents are not emotionally available in this stream grace talks about one i'm going to read through all of these and then we'll we'll watch them um uh, here's what I'm going to do as well. I'm going to pause alerts. Um, if you have questions, you can send them in every, probably every little bit. I don't know exactly when I'll unpause them. So if you have specific questions you'd like to send in, unfortunately, they'll have to be, I won't be able to get to them unless they're super chatted. Most likely I'll try to keep my on, eye on the chat or around the time that I look for questions. Um, but that's how we'll do this going on. In the stream, Grace talks about how, one, she doesn't have a free relationship with her siblings because she's now like their mother. Two, when she and her siblings were supposed to be homeschooled, Grace had to watch and take care of the kids for the entire day because her mother never did anything. And now she feels her mother has completely abandoned her instead of loving her, letting her have her own life. Three, she quit being homeschooled at 13 because her family was cult, was like a cult that didn't want her to go out and make friends. And four, she's turning into a mess and is always made to feel guilty. You tell me how that makes sense. They're not my kids. They're not my kids. I want to have a free relationship with them where I can say I want to hang out with them or not as a sister, not as some kind of surrogate mother. And you can say all you want. You're not putting me in that situation. You are because you feel free to leave. You shouldn't feel free to leave. They're your fucking children. And I did this when I was younger. I bought into your fucking thing when I was 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old. You said, Grace, can you hold down the fort? Can you hold down the fort? So I watched your children for hours every day, hours and hours and hours, probably like 12 hours a day. I watched them. I tried to cook. I tried to keep order. I'm so sick of that. I thought it was over. I thought I was investing in you so that you could come around so that I so that I could live my own life and I can go get my nails done and I can go I can take a shower whenever I want and I don't have to worry about you and how you're doing but instead it just ends up with you leaving you're going to go start your own life no that's my job that's for me i'm the young woman and I did that from when I was eight to about 13. And then I said, you know what? I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to school and I'm just going to do my own thing because I'm just going to live in my room and barely interact with my family because I can't do it. It's like a cult. You guys don't want me to get outside. You don't want me to have friends. You just want me to work for this fucking family. Mom, that's what you want me to do because you're having trouble, right? And I did that from when I was eight to about 13. And then I said, you know what? I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to school. And I'm just going to do my own thing because I'm just going to live in my room 
and barely interact with my family because I can't do it. It's like a cult. You guys don't want me to get outside. You don't want me to have friends. You just want me to work for this fucking family. Mom, that's what you want me to do because you're having trouble, right? Last clip, then we'll talk about it. I wasn't a mess in high school. I mean, I was, but like I did stuff. I went to like practice and stuff. I wasn't just a mess. And now she's turned me back into like that eight year old who's saying like, okay, I wanna, I wanna keep this family together. I hate it. I hate this family. I hate this house. I hate everything we do. I just want some freedom. And I can't like, it just, I'm just finding myself in this position where like, I can't really, I don't feel free to leave because I feel like that would leave my siblings and my dad in this position where I just like, I feel bad for them. I don't want to, I don't want to like, I don't, I'm not ready to start my own life or whatever, but also like, I, I just am not thriving here. Why don't I deserve to thrive? Why don't I deserve to be happy? I'm never happy. I'm always feeling guilty. Why don't I deserve to be happy? Okay. So talked already about the parentified relationship. One thing that I've noticed that often comes as like a um, pattern from this is I, I personally, and also like talking about reading literature and stuff, there's kind of two patterns that I see that emerges a lot of time from parentified children. Uh, so children who have had to take on the role of being a parent too early is depending on their personality, if they're hyper agreeable, these children become highly codependent, uh, never have boundaries, and then kind of maintain a helper role through late into their life until usually they become like resentful enough that it like by the time they're like 30, 32 to 37, they're getting a divorce, they hate their husband, they hate their kids, they hate everyone. Not because they really hate any of these people, but because they've never had boundaries ever because they were taught to never have boundaries because this is the problem with parentifying an eight-year-old. This is the problem with parentifying a 14-year-old is kids don't know what they should and shouldn't say no to. And we teach kids to listen to their parents, which is on average for a healthy family, a good thing for kids to do. The problem is that when parents impose things on their children that are unfair, it leads to these like really, really awful dynamics for kids that kids are just left adjusting and trying to become functional within uh, and it leads to really really toxic patterns the second way that i see this goes out and it's typically for like the more disagreeable kids is they'll be okay with it up until about pubescence which is where your more of your personal identity personality starts to really strongly emerge. It's where um, we see even in the literature, for example, that peer to peer relationships have a lot more to do with the way that people's like personalities and preferences are expressed than their parents, whereas under pubescence, so like under 12 uh, or, or 11 or 10, depending on the kid's age, well, depending on the kid, um, we'll see that the family dynamics and the family is what really orients like what the kid values, what their preferences are, what their personality is. And so what we'll see is these kids that are more disagreeable, especially in pubescence, they'll start realizing being like, wait, I didn't sign up for any of this. Like, I don't want to be these kids' parent. I wanna go be 14. I wanna go be a kid. I wanna go do like random stuff, which is around the age that Grace is uh, decided to go to school. And what we often see is kind of this, um, adaptive boundary system that they create that will cause them problems in the future as well, but it helps them. The, the problem is both of these things that emerge help the kid exist in the family dynamic that's unhealthy. The problem is that when you get into later relationships, they can add up and become damaging into marital relationships and future parent relationships, right? As you can imagine, if you're a parentified child, having your first child is a really distressing experience because all of a sudden you're in the parent role again. Necessarily, you just had a child, right? So the disagreeable child tends to become, they'll say things like, I'm really good at boundaries. Um, 
and they are good at boundaries. Uh, but that's because a lot of their boundaries have walls with like spikes on them. It's kind of like boundaries are like fences. People can choose to hop over them. There just has to be like the necessary consequence of being like, hey, so you know, if you cross over that boundary, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to walk away. I'm going to distance myself from the relationship. Whereas other people set up boundaries where it's like walls with spikes, where like there isn't really a way to come over it. And even if you get close to the boundary, you're going to get hurt, right? Um, I don't know which grace is. I'm just talking broadly and generally about these things. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I wanted to say. The guilt dynamic. The guilt dynamic is super reminiscent as well of this parentified child, right? If you're the parentified child and you're willing to maintain it to some degree throughout your life, it's probably in large part because you care about your family, Be probably because you're human, right? It's very normal and healthy to care for your family. The problem is that a lot of these issues are going to get used against you. A lot of these like natural healthy inclinations. And the problem is that your natural compassion, for example, can become spooky to you because your natural compassion gets weaponized against you. And so you can see how all of these subtle dynamics that are toxic and definitely mind for the kid, um, some of them are blatantly psychological, so some of them are less blatant about whether it's abuse or not. But what matters to me is long term, they have these weird patterns that functionally help you as a child, but once you become an adult can become really destructive, right? Learning as a child to distrust your own compassion can be a good way to start asserting boundaries as a 15 year old. That's the level of nuance I would expect a 15 year old to have around things like boundaries of being like, well, I feel really bad for my siblings. But last time my parents made me feel bad, it made me just lose out on spending time with my friends and my parents didn't even appreciate it that much. So even though I feel bad, maybe I should disregard that. Maybe I should go for the boundary instead, right? That's a decent understanding for a 15 year old to come to. But the problem is if you're 28 or 20 and you're distrusting your own sense of self-compassion, that can be concerning. That means anytime your heart gets pulled on towards another person, you're immediately like, ooh, distrust, right? Imagine how that can affect you. So I'm not saying that this is what's happening for grace, but this is how all of these things can happen, right? Is as different things pop up, it causes you to have aversions and create functional behavioral adjustments to help you cope in a unhealthy family dynamic and the problem is that when you go into other dynamics with other people it doesn't work super well um having boundaries with spikes doesn't work super well in future relationships most people don't want to be friends with people who have boundaries with spikes it's kind of painful and it makes for really 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 messy relationships you're going to see lots of people who break up a lot with like the boundaries of spikes types, they probably have a really hard time maintaining relationships. And probably there's a lot of like power struggling that goes on to force people to stay in relationship with them. All right. On March 31st, this is back to Black Trinity. Remember if I'm here, this is Black Trinity's uh, words. On March 31st, 2023, the family had an eight hour stream where they argued with Courtney over Discord. The majority of the stream was between Ben and Courtney, but there were a few moments where Grace joined in. During the times where Grace was on stream, she leveled a number of, number of accusations against her mother. There were a few things Courtney admitted to, but she didn't comment on any accusation that could get her into legal trouble. Things Courtney does admit to. Number one, telling Grace when she was 16 years old that she hoped she killed herself because Courtney felt Grace was stealing her husband. That is an instance of being abusive towards your child. That doesn't mean that Courtney is always abusive or is consistently an abusive parent, but that is a, an abusive thing to say to your 16-year-old daughter. When she left the family that month, she left a voicemail to the kids telling them she didn't want them to, didn't want to be their mother anymore. I lived on my own essentially when I was 16 because you came up with this crazy idea that because I was friends with dad, that I was stealing your man. And then you came up with all these crazy allegations to, to, to bolster your thing when I was a minor and I was in high school and I dropped out of high school because of you torturing me with this stuff. And then you admitted I had thoughts and you said, I hope she kills herself. That is, I, I do feel like that. I wish she would 
yourself. You said that. We've already gone over this many times. I've explained why I said that. And there was a reason why I said that. And it was kind of brought out of me. Like, you know, like I didn't, it wasn't something that I, it wasn't something that like I was thinking about all the time. You don't think I, maybe you're a little fucking crazy? Uh -huh. Maybe. Maybe? To do that to your 16 year old daughter? Yeah, I'm sorry. I grew up with it. I lived on my own, essentially, when I was 16, because you came up with this crazy idea that because I was friends with dad, that I was stealing your man. And then you came up with all these crazy allegations to, to, to bolster your thing when I was a minor and I was in high school and I dropped out of high school because of you torturing me with this stuff. And then you admitted I had thoughts and you said, I hope she kills herself. That is, I, I do feel like that. I wish she would kill herself. You said that. We've already gone over this many times. I've explained why I said that. And there was a reason why I said that. And it was kind of brought out of me. Like, you know, like I didn't, it wasn't something that I... <laughs> It wasn't something that, like, I was thinking about all the time. You don't think maybe you're a little fucking crazy? Uh-huh. Maybe. Maybe? To do that to your 16-year-old daughter? Yeah, I'm sorry, I grew up with it for... I lived on my own except... Okay. Um... The reaction we see from Courtney there, I don't know anything about Courtney uh, at this point, is... As you can probably suspect, I'm going to say, not going to be the reaction that we would be looking for from a parent who's confronted later on, right? Because there's this dynamic of people can do really shitty things in the, in the past and still correct it to some degree in the future. And the best way that you can try to offset it is by taking accountability and taking maximal responsibility. My like rule of thumb when it comes to apologies for me is that I want to make sure that my apology is as big as the hurt was, right? So if I think that I've done major hurt to somebody, I want to make sure that in my apology to them, I emphasize the size of hurt that I understand I did, right? So if I'm apologizing for something like, um, I think I once made a comment about like how um, I, I made some reference to how my lips were like nicer yeah, than my friends in like the... I basically said my friend was perfect, that if we if we had a baby together, as long as it had everything of hers and my lips, it would be the perfect child. And she felt offended because she felt like I was saying her lips were ugly. Now, I think that that's slightly pedantic, but regardless, the apology for that was, oh gosh, I'm really sorry. That's not at all what I meant. In fact, if you think about that statement, I'm literally saying I'm worse than you in every way, but I guess my lips are nicer. Um, however, in other situations, for example, like major things that have happened between Nick and I, where I know that like a, a set of pattern of reactions that I have had to Nick caused him chronic and consistent hurt for a long time. My apology was profound. It addressed the precise hurt that it had. It, ex it explained how all of it was my responsibility. There were no buts. There was exclusively, I am sorry. And this is why I'm sorry. And this is how it hurt you. And I am aware, you don't have to tell me, I am aware of how this hurt you. And I know it hurt you this way because of this and this thing that's also true about you. And this about your nature that is also true about you. And it had this effect on your life and it had this effect on our marriage and it is only and solely my fault and I am sorry for it, right? So when we're talking about big hurts, it's got to be big apologies. As you can probably suspect, I don't believe that Courtney's apology here is sufficient. Um, it's really disappointing to see a mom. She looks, to be honest, emotionally checked out, but I don't know Courtney's baseline. So this could be lots of emotion for Courtney. I have no idea. Uh, she seems like pretty emotionally like dulled. Um, but when your daughter brings up to you that, you know, 
when she was a kid, you basically said that you wished that she would kill herself because she was stealing your husband. The response isn't, there were reasons why I was saying that. It was being brought out of me. It's like, it, it, it doesn't matter at all. Just to be clear, when you say something like that to your child, the reasons why you said this don't matter, right? The reasons why I had like, um, one of the reactions that I do with Nick a lot is I, I tend to distrust people like to a high level. I basically assume that nobody has my best interests at heart, right? That most people are assuming I'm good and like to not worry about me. And I basically always assume that people will assume Kyla is okay getting the short end of the stick because that was my life growing up was getting the short end of the stick and everyone being like, but you'll be fine. You're good, right? You're functional. Um, and so what happened is that when like ambiguous situations would go on where I could read it a million ways, I would always read it with the way that Nick was being not thoughtful towards me. And I would react in such a way where I'd be like offended. And he would, we would sometimes quickly resolve it where he's like, no, that's not what I meant. And I was like, oh, okay, okay. Like, good to know. But over four years, that says something to Nick. It means that Nick, who's one of the most considerate human beings I have probably met in my entire life. That man spends more time thinking about others than I think I've met anyone anywhere thinks about anything. It's, in, it's insane. He's so intentional with everything that he does that for four years, I was constantly showing him that I wasn't willing to see him over my pain, despite the fact that he didn't do anything wrong. There were reasons why I reacted that way to Nick. And those reasons have nothing to do with Nick. My apology shouldn't go, but there's reasons why I was doing those things to you. I'm really sorry for always reacting like you're the bad guy who has my, doesn't have my, like my best, uh, the best for me in mind. But you know, when I was a child, blah, 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 blah. This is like the, this is like the trauma dumper who like, the person who's done like enough introspective work to realize that there's reasons why they've done fucked up things, but not enough introspective work to realize that when you're apologizing to the hurt that you've done to others because of your fucked up shit, nobody cares about the backstory. All they want to know is that you're sorry and what you're going to do about it, right? And so when you tell somebody, I'm sorry, but there's reasons why I did that, all people hear is, I'm not that sorry, it's not really my fault. And that's not responsibility, right? Even if there are reasons for why uh, Courtney was saying that, and I suspect that there is, right? There are understandable processes by which a mother could be brought to a place where she starts believing that her child is trying to steal her husband, right? Seems like in the same place, but there's probably reasonable steps that a mother gets there. It's still not the child's fault, and the apology needs to take that into account. As simple as that. Of course, the backstory matters. I think a couple of reasons I, I care about the lore. Of course, you care about the lore for your partner. You don't care about it for the apology. I promise you. You care about the lore after the apology. So all what you do is, I'm sorry. And everything that's baked in with that. And then once the person goes, I really appreciate that. That usually opens up the door for, are you open to hearing like, uh, the realizations I needed about myself to understand why I do the behaviors. And almost 100% of the time, people say, yes, absolutely, right? That's when you give them the lore. When the person has heard your apology, you've sat in their feelings because an apology is, if an apology is for you, don't make it. And if you're making an apology, it should exclusively and only be for the other person, which means your backstory to make you feel better about why you did bad things shouldn't come up right now. All that should be coming up is the hurt that you've done. You can get to the backstory later. You always can. There's always time. Okay. I have an audio recording of you saying, I don't want to be your mother anymore. Goodbye, kids. Yes, you do. There's a lot of stuff against me. I understand that. I have an audio recording. Note, 
There was another stream four months before this one where Courtney told Grace that she treated her so poorly that when she was younger, she was crazed with jealousy at how cr close Grace was with her father. Yeah, and you, you basically were saying, like, don't you care about me at all? Like, don't you care about me? Like, why are you, like, why are you treating me like this? Right? And the reason why I was treating you like that was because I was just crazed with jealousy over you and like your relationship with your father. And I just, I just was completely out of my mind with jealousy and anger that you took him away from me. Uh, and you, you, okay. I think a lot of people are going to take that in possibly the most pernicious direction because of some of the claims I know are circulating about Ben Thorpe. I am not saying those claims are true or false. I'm just going to give a couple of other possible explanations that you have to think about if we want to think about things in any level of nuance. And if you don't want any of nuance, just mute my stream for like five minutes. We'll, we'll, we'll get back, okay? Parentified children, hearing a mother tell a, ch a child, especially like the oldest child or the favorite child of the other spouse that they're jealous of them, doesn't always have to have sexual connotations. I know everyone is thinking about that in some way that like that's a red flag for sexual stuff. And it, it could be, it very, it is, it is a red flag. I'm not saying that it is happening or has or hasn't happened. I'm clearly not saying that. It is a flag that I would note, right? If like, if you were doing any sort of assessment, you would note that. The issue is that I have heard parents talk about this, particularly think about the situations that are required to parentify a child, right? It means one of the parents is out. And if this case, say it was Courtney who was out, I don't actually know, but that's what Grace is claiming. Grace feels that Courtney tapped out. The question is why? It could be because Courtney is a very selfish woman who's kind of like, she's pro it would probably be a narcissistic level where um, she is abjectly rejecting the tenets and responsibilities of being a mother. And the moment her, ch her oldest child is old enough to take over the responsibilities offsets all of those. I think the likelihood of that is pretty low. The next probably much more likely, much more common thing is high levels of mental health, right? Postpartum depression, just standard depression, um, tons of things that cause the parent to shut down, become emotionally unavailable, and to be unable to function and keep up with the extremely demanding costs of managing and running a family. Other things could be because obviously, I'll, I'll give the other possibility as well, it could be the case that at this point, Courtney was emotionally and psychologically abused to the point that she had been eroded into like a non-functioning human. That is also theoretically possible. It's possible that all three of these things are going on to some degree at once, right? But um, something's happened that has caused Grace to feel parentified by Courtney, that Grace feels like she had to take over the role, according to Grace. And it's important to understand what that could be and what dynamic that would introduce. If you're a woman and you're seeing your oldest child getting closer to your husband, especially if you're building tension, because I imagine that if you are parentifying your child uh, to some degree, um, there's tension between you and your partner as well, because you're probably not going to be agreeing on that. And you see them taking up a bunch of roles. The parentified child always gets reinforced, by the way. This is why being a parentified child is super mind because you get applauded for being so mature for your age. And the problem is that she's so mature for her age is sometimes just an innocent thing, but it's also a yellow flag because sometimes there's there's a reason why kids are sometimes too mature for their age, right? Um, but the problem is when you're a parentified child, all you hear is, wow, you're so mature for your age. Wow, you're such a go-getter. Wow, you're so helpful around the house. You just get praised for it. So you keep doing it because it feels nice because people are praising you for it. And then it becomes central to your identity. And it's super, super hard to move away from that. Uh, sorry, I'm getting... I'm trying not to respond to certain comments. Um, okay, we're gonna say this one more time. 
if you're tuning in and you would just like to moralize, probably this isn't the stream for you. I explained at the beginning of the stream why we're covering this and what we're going to uh, respond to. Okay. Uh, mods, go ahead and you can just time people out if they keep moralizing. Um, just going to distract me. If you're a woman and you're seeing your oldest child take over a bunch of your roles and responsibilities and getting reinforced all the time, there are reasons that, especially if mental illness is possibly going on or narcissism, which is also mental illness to some degree, why you could come to have high levels of jealousy of that child that aren't necessarily indicative of something inherently like sinister going on. Now it is still a red flag, but it isn't necessarily a red flag. Um, and when we're talking about these, these family dynamics, I think a lot of times our society in recent years has done a pretty good job, probably probably too good of a job talking about kids, dysfunctional parenting, and the impacts that childhood dysfunction can have on you as an adult. I think we've done probably too good of a job to the point that we're pathologizing every single thing that's just like unhealthy in, um, in early childhood, which I don't think is the right way to view development because pathology is medical. And I don't view these things as medical. What we've not done a good job is understanding what's occurring in the childhood dysfunction that is leading to and the experiences of the dysfunctional parents. How do these two individuals feel through that process? And there's a reason why we don't talk about it much. Because to be honest, when we're talking about healing, the main person who matters is the kid who's almost entirely blameless throughout the entire thing. So the orientation is correct there. The issue is that it causes us to forget about some things, which is how is it going to feel? And how do you process that? When a child takes over all of your roles as an adult woman, they get all the reinforcement from everyone while your partner probably shames you and makes you feel like shit, uh, for not doing things rightly or wrongly. And how is that going to change your relationship to your own children? How is that going to feel? Because there's always this kind of ebb and flow and, and like give and take of these different things, right? If your relationship with your oldest child is now marred with constant, constant reinforcement that you're a failure, that you're a bad mom, and because you're a bad mom, especially in Catholic spaces, especially in, let's be honest, most gender traditional spaces, if you're a bad mom, you're a failed woman, right? These two things are almost unseparatable. We don't think about what that experience is going to be for that individual and how it's going to change the dynamic with her child. And it doesn't make it excusable. It's still just awful for the child, right? It's still horrible that you would say those things to your child. Your child is not the place for you to process out all of your emotional feelings about the situation. But it now makes a relationship that you are probably very biologically drawn to, to want to also become a major source of shame and pain. And the problem is internalized shame because externalized blame, right? If you feel shame from a thing, you're going to blame it. Like nine times out of 10, whatever you see somebody blaming, it's because they feel some sort of shame connected to it. Like, super, super often. All right. Back to the article. The other accusations Grace makes are from back when Ben was still a school teacher and Courtney was a housewife that was supposed to be homeschooling the kids. Grace accuses Courtney of one, physically abusing uh, Grace's younger brother, John. Two, never taking care of the house to the point where they had rats and moldy dishes in the kitchen. And three, forcing Grace to fake documents related to Courtney homeschooling the kids. Um, for a number of reasons, I'm going to bypass the video of this. I'm just going to take her at her word. Uh, we'll do these other two, though. And, and, and that's just one of the things. How about when dad was working and you had rats living in the house? He was working all day teaching he'd come home and try to catch the rats and kill them and put out poison 
You left the kitchen disgusting, moldy dishes every day. You'd sit there and tell me to clean up all of it. Disgusting, grime coating the cabinets. Mouse and rat feces everywhere. Sometimes in the food. Every box of cereal nibbled at. The, the bag was nibbled at. We knew mice or moths or rats had been in there. You were staying at home. You didn't have a job. That's How not... are you in that? Okay, I, I think you're getting the timeline a bit confused. How are you going to explain that? No, that was before Abyssinia. How are you going to explain the rats? Why didn't you fucking clean the kitchen? Why didn't you tell your children? Why didn't you have chores? Why? And you want custody? Yeah. What the fuck are you talking about? And, and, and that. Joint custody when you told your daughter to kill her, that you hope she dies, when you had your daughter commit educational fraud to the Department of Education to cover your for not educating your children for years upon years upon years. You had me sign the papers with your name. You had me fabricate the documents. You had me write the homework to pretend we had we've been educated. I don't know anything about we, that. You don't know anything about that? Well, I have the documentation, so. Okay. You sat there, you gave me the laptop, and you said, Grace, fake it. Fake that we did homeschooling this year. For each of the guys. And you promised that. me. You know what's the saddest part? You promised me every time that you would do something nice for me after I committed fucking fraud for you. And you never did it. Not once. You never actually did something nice. Like, take me somewhere. You just fucking used me. And you'd make me go in and hand them the documents because I was a kid. So they'd take them from me. And you made me fucking scramble around coming up with all of the reports for my five siblings and fake the grades and fake the books that we read and fake the math and write the reports in, in and I would have to write with my left hand to fake Charlie and Tommy's childish writing, right? And you said, yeah, do that year after year, like for five, for six years straight at least. You did that. And the attendance cards, I remember I would print them and I'd have to sit there filling out, oh, maybe we missed, okay, we missed 16 days this year. Joint. Note, there was another stream. Uh, note, we did this one. Uh, okay. Courtney says, I don't remember that, but Grace goes into such elaborate detail about the process that I'm more inclined to believe her accusation is true. Um, can't say whether it is true or not. Um, one thing we do know is uh, elaborate liars are very uncommon. Typically, like some, so behavioral markers of anything are weak, which is why a lot, I shouldn't say this because a lot of courts do let behavioral analysis. Behavioral analysis should never be allowed in court, just to be very clear. So I'm going to do some talking about behavioral analysis, but be aware it's weak enough that it shouldn't be included in court, in my opinion. And I think the polygraph should, okay? <laughs> to give you some like strengths versus weaknesses. Um, one thing that some behavioral analysts will say about lying, that is more of a cue of lying going on, is vagueness. Typically, when people are highly, highly, highly overly precise, it means that lying is not occurring. The problem is that that knowledge is decently publicized uh, to the point that you see it in anything. And the problem with behavioral analysis is that anything that maybe in the past did map on well to, for example, uh, predictive behaviors or predictive behaviors that are predictive of mindsets or future behaviors. Uh, once you publish it and the public gets knowledge of it and somebody learns it, now somebody can fake doing those actions and to make you think that they're being truthful when they're not, right? So now sophisticated liars are going to go, oh, vagueness is a sign of lying. So sophisticated liars will be more complex in it. But 
I will be clear that in the past, at least it was established that vagueness is typically an indicator of lying, whereas like high levels of precision are more uh, proof of somebody truth telling. Um, but to be clear, the idea that trauma causes you to have like hyper crystallized memories where like you can remember like the fine grain details of like the dust spores falling around you doesn't seem to be super well established. With the Crowder stuff coming out just one month after these events, it's no real surprise that Grace ended up with hardcore projecting her experiences with her mother onto Crowder's wife. She's not making arguments for attention. She actually believes what she says. That is Black Trinity, just to be clear. Accepting father's abuse. Now that we've gotten a better look at Grace's history with her mother, there's a much clearer picture on, uh, of the family th of the Thorpe family dynamic and why Grace seems to be so attached to her father. When a child experiences neglect and abandonment, and abandonment, they are much more likely to tolerate and excuse other forms of abuse from important people in their lives. True. As the fear of losing that person significantly outweighs the pain of ex they experience being around them. From all the VODs that I've seen, Grace has expressed on multiple occasions that one of her biggest fears is turning out like her mother, and this vulnerability is a common vector of attack that Ben uses to keep Grace in line. There's one stream in particular on April 17th, 2023, where Grace br gravely offends her father. And from that point on, he's just endlessly rude and mean towards her while poking at her insecurities. And as he's doing this, she's just smiling and nodding along with him while saying he is exactly correct about every negative thing he says about her. And over the course of the stream, Grace is slowly broken down until she is left crying and insulting herself at the end of the stream. So what was the initial offense that led to this interaction? Grace tried to sing along to Ben's joke. Oh, she responded. Okay. Text, textually. When I get that feeling, I need textual healing. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a good song. Also for Protestants. Textual. Sexual. Healing. Yes, toilet. Oh, baby. Grace, try not to like run over my joke as I'm making it, but okay. As I'm making it, you have to, like, change it. I'm sorry, yeah. No, whatever. All right. Before we get into this, I'm going to suspect... I'm going to do the cringe trigger warning shit because I think it's relevant here. Because trigger warnings are useful for when people aren't expecting content. I haven't watched all of these clips, um, but I suspect watching somebody slowly be berated in response to that is going to be awful and for people who have been emotionally derided by their own parents it's going to be particularly hard to watch so i'm giving the heads up now we are going to watch it um uh but i am giving you the heads up that that is about to, to occur so at this moment that the sh mood completely shifted there's a lot there's going to be a lot of clips here but they are all essential to understanding the dynamic between grace and her father I will say this, as somebody has now talked to Ben a couple of times uh, publicly, only once privately in the Discord, um, he is an extremely um, kind of volatile person. Uh, one of the things I kind of most remarked about him is I can never tell what's real. Uh, it like I at all like when he says there's chemistry between us, I can't decide if he's saying that because I he knows that I find him creepy and uncomfortable to be around, and he's trying to like like poke at me or if he because he thinks that we actually have chemistry um it's mostly just annoying to me because uh, we don't have chemistry and i dislike him uh but i can't tell how much he believes it um i suspect on stream ben is 90 percent performance um but i suspect that possibly with his family there's less of that and one thing i've noticed that's very strange about him is that he'll become very angry very quickly uh very happy very quickly he's very sudden with uh, emotional shifts all right there's going to be a lot of clips here but they're all essential to better understanding the dynamics between grace and her father we're going to play all four read this and then i'll comment um i will take questions here because i know there's been a bunch of super chats i'll answer questions uh, here. So if you would like a question sent in, send them in Super Duster Donos. I'm sorry. I'll try to read some comments for free as well. I'm not just trying to be a money grubber. It's just Super Chats show up on my like label system so I can find them really easily. And bits. Uh, don't send in your question through like uh, uh, like 
resubbing. I those don't show up in the labels very well. So, um, well, but I don't understand. Can we revisit that? I was making, I think, a funny joke about textual healing, and I was going to go on with my lyrics about how don't live, leave me undelivered. Yeah, and you I decided to just to just jump into it, push me aside, and say I want to talk about this other joke. Yeah, That's like which is a which is a variation of my joke, but you didn't have anything worked out, and you just decided I'm gonna just say like no, actually I will, let's do sexual healing, which has some potential, but like why do you just I'm on TV on my channel, and you're just like oh no, let's do a different joke in the middle of your joke. How do you think like a comedian would feel if someone just go runs up from the audience and or another comedian goes like, oh, actually, I'm going to finish that joke and change it. Uh, wouldn't this be funny? I think it sucks. I'm sorry. I think it sucks. I well, this is the it. problem that we have. It's the problem yeah, this is the problem. This is what we're going to talk about here. And then you act like a Now everyone in your chat, I'm sure, is going, oh, Grace, do you see how you're of him? I think it's fucking obnoxious. It is obnoxious. I'm not standing by it. I shouldn't have interrupted you. I'm sorry. Uh, whatever. Well, you didn't. It's a, it's a problem. No, I don't want to hear sorry. I want you to say, yeah, this is why we need to do this stream. I'm glad we're doing it because I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. I, I, yes. I have a serious problem. So. All right. Well, you, you said like instead you, of agreeing you, with me that you're a worthless piece of crap, I don't. If that's your conclusion for me offering any criticism, then I well, that is actually what I think we have to explore. If that's your conclusion, that if I criticize you in the slightest, like your mother said, right? If I criticize her, look at anything or point anything out mm -hmm. that isn't supportive. I can't live in the same house as you. That was her conclusion. And if that's the case, then you should do as your mother's doing. And that's what I'm saying is kind of like fly away because I don't want that. All right. I think criticism, the, the way I offer criticism is, if anything, overly generous. Yeah, you're a very generous, very, very supportive person. I would say that you, I offer you the right amount of criticism and support. And if anything, it's too supportive and not critical enough. And you agree with that in theory, but in actual practice, you act like you're a of me. Yeah. And that you no, need a lot true. more support and you cry and break down. And yeah. Yeah. everyone flocks to your aid and wants to destroy your family like your mother does. Same right, thing. Right. So no. you vulner make everyone here vulnerable by doing this. Yeah, I mean, I, I as well as breaking me down psychologically, and in every way, because this is compelling to you, the victim narrative. Yes, it's. And I think you need to be honest about that instead of making excuses. I would say, I'm not intending in any way to change my personality towards you. So chat and you and your mother can try to break me down and go, yeah, I need to be more of a, like a touchy feely guy and more supportive. And I think I would say then get out of my life. I intend to change. Cause I am never reality. going to do that. So I think you need to make a change and your mother needs to make a change and your siblings need to make a change. Not me. I intend to do, uh, yeah, okay, okay. I would like to change my personality so that it's less. Because I don't have a problem with how I of this act as a father. Yeah, I, I, you don't have a problem with it. I don't have a problem with it. I'm the wishy washy. Well, you do, in actual fact, have a problem with it. Your behavior seems to evidence that you have a problem with it. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But on paper, I don't. But, right. In real life, I complain about it. Okay, so. No, in your actions, you act like a. Yes, yes. We're going to continue. I'll talk at the end of this. A bit after this point, Grace had to go and take care of the kids while her dad streamed. 
comes back a few hours later and Ben goes right back to criticizing her her a little more about how poorly she's taking care of the household before letting her take over the stream for the rest of the night. Number one, Ben compares her to her mother again and says that she's allowed to fail and leave too. He guilts her by saying things may be a little hard on him and the kids, but he can just hire a maid because her responsibilities are so easy. Well, I'm saying you can, like your mother, totally fail because I, I do think it's like the psychic stress may be too much for you. Mm-hmm. But I'm not going to sit here and have you sort of fail and claim that you're the victim of that. Just fail if you're going to fail. Something cleaner about it. No, will that put me and Joe and your sister in a tough situation? Yeah, and I think I'll hire a maid. Because I'll tell you something. It's not that hard to make a little food and keep the place clean. I think someone can do that in two hours a day easily. <laughs> I agree. Well, I'm saying. Ben leaves the stream and Grace takes over. Grace talks to the stream about the conversation she just had and slowly begins to cry. She's afraid she's going to be just like her mother. I'm going to actually talk about Ben since Ben leaves the stream. When somebody loves you and has is claiming to have your best interests at heart, the way you know that that's true is that they spend most of the time building you up and talking about things that will actually help you. Not talking about how you're bad, how you're visiting them, and how you're ruining them and ruining their life. They're not going to keep pointing out your insecurities. And when you concede about things that you've done that maybe were wrong, which I don't agree with her that she did anything wrong here, but if they concede on, say, something that you needed to give a slight correction to. Say something actually happened that needed a correction to. So, for example, say in this dynamic, instead of ben, Grace just, like, singing along and, like, altering his joke, I guess, a little bit, like, stealing his thunder. Say instead, he was trying to, like, start singing a joke, and he's like, oh, and she was like, oh my gosh, that's fucking cringe. Shut the fuck up. Say she did something actually rude. And he gave her a slight correction, and she goes, you're right. That was wrong. I'm really sorry. Somebody with your best interest immediately would leave that. They would just move on because her apology seemed legitimate. It seemed conciliatory. It took maximal responsibility. It was the type of apology we talk about, which is why to get to another point, somebody taking responsibility is a good thing. Somebody thrusting maximal responsibility onto you is not. There's this concept I've been trying to find the language for that I think is really 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 important to understand yourself and others which is some advice is essential for you to give to others but for you to not take on yourself and some advice and statements are things you should only say to yourself and you should not put on others i think like pull yourself up by your bootstraps for example is a really good statement to say to yourself I think having the mindset of I'm going to take responsibility maximally for myself and do everything I can to put myself in the right place and time so that I can maximize towards the things that I would like, right, is a great orientation to have to yourself. Not such a good thing to say to other people. It's unempathetic, it's mean, and it's typically missing the necessary nuance and context that is required for these types of conversations. What's going on here is kind of unironic, Darvel, from what I'm seeing. Let's try to give, I'm trying to think right now if there is any other thing that could be going on outside of this context that could make me think that what Ben is doing is reasonable here. The only possibility of how these clips could possibly be more neutral than they appear at this point is that Ben and Grace had already had a really big fight about this. It's not even neutral. It would just make it less sinister than it is. I would still say that even if all this extra context I give is true, what Ben is doing here is still inappropriate, not inappropriate, it's toxic and unhealthy, but it's more, it's more understandable, which would be if what she did there is akin to something that she does to him constantly all the time. They've talked about it a million times. In the past, she would like refuse to take accountability. She refused that it was going on. Then she got around when he like pointed it out a bunch of times and told her how it made him feel. Maybe. 
And so when she does this again, he kind of flies off the chain because they've talked about it a million times. They had just had a fight about it like 30 minutes before. And she's like doing the same thing again, right? I'm not saying it's healthy, but I'm trying to think like, because I basically steal mad the opposite of like what could be going on that would be more neutral. It's possible that like he's flying off the handle if something like this had happened again, like 30 minutes before. So it's like that situation of somebody keeps saying, I'm really sorry. I am, I promise you, I'm really sorry. And then they do the same thing over and over and over and over and over again, which is why he would say things like, I, I don't want your sorry, right? I want change of behavior. Just to be clear though, if all of that context, let's assume all that context was true, which we have no idea, we have no idea if that's true, the way he responds here is still unhealthy. It would be more within the realm of human unhealthy, like well, all of it's human, but like, it'd be more in the realm of like more neutral unhealthy, where it's like, this is unhealthy, but probably not immoral, right? It's not like a bad thing. It's just like, this is not the way ever to confront somebody about a behavior you dislike. Even if you're exasperated and you've confronted them on it 37 times before, and they've apologized for it 37 times before, and it literally never changes, this is probably still not super conducive. Um, but if if somebody's just being conciliatory to the point that they're starting to like take on criticisms of you like willingly and you're still strong arming them like there's no right answer that's a really big flag to me about the relationship if if you're in a conversation with somebody and you're at the point where nothing you say can be right especially if you can view it from the outside, that's really concerning because then they can never be right. Another really big flag that I see here is the idea of I change for no one. Everyone else around me is wrong. I probably don't need to st state this strongly, but that's a really big red flag. Um, first of all, your personality is not fixed. In many ways, you are who you choose to be. There are elements that are somewhat fixed by like genetics and stuff, but this concept that like you just have to accept who you are and come into who you are, it gives us conception to ourselves that who I am is this fixed immutable thing. But just to be clear, the idea like people don't change, people are always changing. People are constantly changing in small and subtle ways. And every now and then, people are intentionally going out of their ways to maximally change. Um, people do change regularly. Certain core traits about them don't change, like whether they're extroverted or introverted. That doesn't change. Like Most people don't go from introvert to extrovert unless they were an introvert because they were just socially anxious. But this idea of like, it's all of my kids' fault and my wife and all of them need to change because I don't have a problem with me. Anytime somebody says to me, you just have to accept me for who I am, I'm not changing, is a massive red flag. And I go, yeah, I'm not interested in being in relationship with this person. Um, in all interpersonal dynamics, so much is negotiable. Who you are is not your tone. Who you are is not whether uh, you watch one show or another. Who you are is not specific languages that you choose to include or exclude based on your interpersonal partner's needs, right? There's certain words, for example, that I wouldn't say to Nick that I might be fine saying to somebody else, right? Even somebody super close to me. There's some people like one of my best friends. There's this couple of specific words that for very, very good reasons are kind of trigger words for her. They're just like, she just has a hard time hearing them. So I intentionally never say those words, even though I would say those words to anybody else because I'm willing to change for her because people change all the time. People change constantly. Some things are fixed, but a lot more things are flexible. All right. We'll move on to after Ben leaves. She begins to cry and she's afraid she's going to be just like her mother. Every time my dad says, but it's not my dad saying, it's, it's just reality. But whenever there's something like, you know, you need to uh, get it together or find a different situation that uh, makes more sense, I cry. And it troubles me. Why does it trouble me? I 
I think it's because I'm afraid that I am attached to a fantasy that like it is this uh, this is a beautiful house I'm in a beautiful house with three people that I love very much and my dog and I have everything available to me so I guess I'm kind of a I'm just kind of nervous that like I am actually like not gonna make that work I'm gonna let that opportunity go and I'm gonna I don't know after the five years I'm not gonna sort of bring it around I'm just gonna like be in the same place as my mom like why don't we just call it now I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be a different person I'm not, I'm not. <sighs> so stupid. I'm such a f loser crying about this. Such a f loser. Whatever. Such a f loser. Why don't we just call it now? I'm Chris accepts. She receives from her father because she believes it's warranted. She believes she's a problem and a nuisance for her father, and so she has a strong desire to win his approval by doing whatever he says. At least for me, this seems to explain why she's been doing whatever she can to help him grow his YouTube following. And this directly leads to the most disturbing part of this post. All right, before we get to the uh, most disturbing part of the post, I'm going to turn on alerts because I told people that they can send in their questions. I will answer a bunch of questions, and there's then we'll kind of go forward from here. Uh, so okay. there's going to be a bunch of alerts. I like to encourage a bit of dissidence, within margins. I think it's helped tremendously. You've got to let them do them sometimes. True. See people with a margin of error. There's only one type of eel. Okay. Dot. All right. I'll just go through. Um... What are the questions? One thing that sticks out to me, Grace's mom said the fears of her losing her husband was brought out of her. I think I can see Ben's push there. It could be a third and he's just attempting to be charismatic. Thanks for doing this, was hoping you'd cover them. All right. You realize that they're both in the chat right now. Of course, I assume that they would be in the chat. Yes. All right, um, rules for the chat. Now that I'm aware that they're in the chat, uh, well, I assume that they're gonna be in the chat, but reading the comments now in the chat. Um, they're allowed to be in the chat. Um, your guys' role in the chat is not to uh, white knight. It's not to save anybody. It's not to take out all of your personal feelings and gripes against the uh, content creators themselves or to pick fights. You can comment about things, but if you're ac making targeted questions that are clearly over the line, I'm going to be encouraging my mods to time you out. Um, that goes for Grace and Ben as well. If you guys are clearly poking the bear, if you're act looking for reactions from commenters, if you're trying to like beg for like uh, negative interactions from people, um, I'm just going to time you out. Uh, yeah, uh, in general, I just, that doesn't happen to my stuff. One thing that sticks out to me, Grace's mom said the fears of her losing her husband was brought out of her. I think I can see Ben's push there. It could be a third and he is just attempting to be charismatic. Thanks for doing this. Was hoping you'd cover them. Right. Any last questions? There's only one type of eel. Can you talk okay. about the psychology ethics Dots. of uh, milking gambling money? Uh, 
I feel like that's not related to this right now, so no. <laughs> uh, in the future, though, sure. Uh, I pulled out toxic feelings towards my relatives, and I didn't even know what were there. All right. When somebody has come to be like the greatest ooga booga in your life, right? Whoever that character is. I think in the case of uh, the Thorpe's life, it very much is characterized by Courtney. Uh, it's at least weaponized against Grace, and she talks about being afraid of being like her mom a lot. Um, everyone has this character. It's usually a parent, it's often a parent, but sometimes it's a, a family member, an uncle, an aunt, uh, a friend, somebody in your life who they've come to really have disdain for, um, that you probably used to have a close relationship to or had some sort of close dynamic where they were interacting a lot and have a lot of history together. Again, when you love somebody and you're trying to encourage change, there are times, for example, where like Nick and I have talked about, um, I'm always going to talk about myself. Uh, so just to be clear, when we talk about like a Nick and I's dynamic, I bring up my stuff a lot because Nick gets to bring up Nick's stuff, like uh, specifically Nick's wrongdoing. I bring up Nick's wrongdoing as little as possible, not because there is none and not because Nick hasn't been wrong in our relationship plenty of times, but because in the public domain, I want to only share my stuff um, for, I think, self-evident reasons. There's been times where we've had really tough conversations where, again, there's like this toxic pattern of um, victimhood. Let's talk about victimhood. Victimhood is like my uh, family's personal favorite. Um, I would say I absolutely get this from my mom, um, where there is this pattern of leaning into being a victim and how like the noble, beautiful victim is maximally empathizable with. Uh, you can always care about her. She's usually a her. And there's almost almost this moral armor that gets crafted around you in your self-narrative when you establish a self-victim narrative, right? It is, right? Ben isn't wrong about a bunch of this stuff. It is very compelling. It is highly seductive. It is hard to break out of. And the biggest problem with it when you're trying to break out of it is to know when something is genuinely wrong against you and being done wrong against you that needs to be confronted and addressed and when it is you leaning into kind of like a self-pity stuff and there have been times in nick and i's conversation where i've like looked at things and i've been like oh wow this is just like what my mom does usually it would be after we'd come home from like a family dynamic and i was like frustrated about something that happened and i was like when my mom or like my brother did that thing is that what I'm doing to you when you say that you're feeling frustrated about this thing? And my brother and Nick will always be like, yes. Here's the key thing. Nick doesn't come to me and weaponize the people who have hurt me against me. He doesn't say, wow, you're being just like X person who you hate and you don't want to be like, why are you being just like your mother? Being just like this? Because that's not how you love people. That's not how you actually help people, right? That isn't helpful. It's again that thing of what advice you give to others that's helpful and what advice is only helpful if you give it to yourself. And this is like the lessons for the self can't be stolen by somebody else. I'm so glad that Nick never said things like, when you do this, it's just like your mom. Instead, he said, you're doing this and it hurts me in this way, right? And over time I went, oh, when I was doing this, it looks just like this, like my mom. And he would go, yeah, he was never weaponizing my mother. I came to that realization on my own. And because I came to that realization on my own, it A, left humanity for me and my mom, because I have a deeper relationship with my mom. I know my mom more complexly. When I say this is like my mom, it's way less weaponized than if somebody else says it to me. Because when I say it, I know that I'm meaning it in like the softest way. And it's really, really important to emphasize this. All right. Ben sexualizing his daughter. Just two days after that stream with Grace crying, on April 19th, 2023, Grace and Ben appeared on another streamer's channel named Hormaxer. Hormaxer is a streamer that is mostly known for appearing with the on the Playing With Fire YouTube channel Alex, the pickup artist, live streams as a guest to go on e-dates where he acts creepy towards the women. 
true. Throughout the statement, Max herself degrades Grace on multiple occasions, and both him and Grace's own father encourage her to do so, to do increasingly sexual things on stream in order to get more people to come to the stream. There's even one moment in the stream where Grace's father laughs while saying, despite the fact that Grace is smiling, he knows she's going to start acting like a victim again and be upset with him for weeks after the stream ends. Um, I'm going to give you the self-evident uh, heads up. Uh, I've seen... I don't know which of these clips. I've seen one of these clips. I personally found it pretty uncomfortable. So take that where you will. But also I know but by saying that I'm poisoning the well. And obviously by this description, it's creating a very specific narrative. So you can include that or exclude that from your view. Grace will wear a nice shirt that will bring him over here. And then we keep him over here. I have or, never seen Grace as a yet one piece of really feminine lingerie, garter, uh, Grace, and everything. Well, all right, all right, Uncle Max, can He's we? He's afraid talk of her own sexuality, even right. wearing sexual clothing. All right, oh, Uncle Max, Lord. can we pop her cherry tonight? Can we just pop her you cherry? Think you think you know? I would love to. I'll be okay. right back. Okay, Grace will wear a nice shirt that will bring him over. Grace returns to the stream in a corset or makes some sexual comments to her and Ben tells Grace to, sh to show the stream her body. Is a dedicated group of fans. Oh! Good, Grace. I see your tits. They look nice. I'd like to fondle yeah. you. You're welcome. At least you look feminine. Thank God. At least you look feminine. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Okay, but now she's acting like I have, I have, uh, what, deflowered her on the internet. No, this isn't a big deal. So are you going to Bring the game to keep me on the stream, or is it just going to be... What do you need me to grace to kiss your ass on stream? You sit there with no. your tits hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever you're in, I like mean... a boost. Well, let's see, well is, Grace, yeah. let's, see the whole, let's see the whole thing. What do we got? Well, I don't know. He's He doesn't know how to run his own stream. No, your, your, you know, the rest of your outfit, though. What is it? How, I mean... Oh, no, it's just the shirt. It's corset. Well, can we see it? Or what? Let's see, because those fat book mommies are going to get very jealous, oh, you know, okay. Grace. They're so very jealous, too. That's oh, sad. those women are the worst type of jealous in oh, the world. Oh, and you're wearing sweatpants underneath it? Yeah. Oh, for All God's right. sakes, Grace. Can you put on garters? And... Yeah. One step at a time. Is a dedicated group of fans. Oh, Good, Grace. Oh. I see your tits. They look nice. Yep. Ben asks Grace if she's on their team and asks and tells her to shake her tits and ask to get more viewers in the stream. <clears throat> he then makes a joke about how Grace's mother wouldn't like what she's doing. Grace, are you on the team here or what? I'm on the team. Well, I thought what, we were going to be stream sniping. Why don't you send some of these guys? Tell, call them out by name, Bash. Well, why don't you go on there, there, Grace? It's, 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 hey, it's hey, Grace. his Coomer Army. It's his Coomer Army. Hey, Grace, why don't you go on yeah, there? You're, you're Joan of Arc, right? And your little sticky, little perky sticking out. And go tell them to bring them over here and use some bait then. What do you think? Yeah. I'm the bait to bring them over? Yeah. Go say, hey, if you want a real woman over here, come on over here. How about that? Why don't you lose your little ass, Grace, and use your little sexual appeal that you claim to have. No, Let's that's what I'm talking baby. about. All right. Fucking princess, get lost. Go shake your ass out on the streets of Vegas of the internet. That's right. I'd bring back some boys. Highway. I'd sell Grace's ass on Boulder Highway. Yeah. Right, get out there on Boulder uh, Highway. She's not even, back not even, money. she hasn't even worked up to the strip yet. Now call her mother, call her mother and get her on here and get her to go, oh, Grace, you've got to stop this. Oh, shut up, Courtney. <laughs> shut up. Shut up, Courtney, you dysugenic subhuman woman. Rodder. Um, okay. For the sake of, like, trying to attempt some level of, like, neutrality, um, everything about this disgusts me. I don't, either, I, I don't think I can actually manage SD men in any way. Um, even, especially because they're Catholic. Um, yeah. It's, it's not, and the issue is, it's not a woman choosing to want to be actually cute. obviously i have no problem with women wanting to look pretty and sexy on the internet it's maxer's comments and yes the guy who puts vaseline over his camera talks like that about women all the time 
He's always degrading and disgusting. Um, it's her dad being comfortable with it and encouraging it. It's just, it's, it, from every level, it's insane to me. Um, so I'm going to say that that is my personal bias going forward. I, I won't, I don't think I'll be able to get out of this one. Uh, there's no way that I'm going to be able to steal man this one. I'm sorry. Uh, in any way or try to be like, maybe this is like the, but I just, uh, this one is just like, it's just gross to me. Sorry. Ben asks Grace if she's on their team. Uh, Baxter talks about how he wants to actually violate grace ben laughs and says that even though grace is smiling now she's gonna act, act like a victim when the stream is over remember what i said about bringing up people like the feared person weaponizing against that person and this victim stuff that keeps coming up if somebody keeps constantly reinforcing to you that you're going to be a victim that's sussy And actually, I'm going to say more than this. That's sussy because as somebody who I think in the past has had a bit of a propensity at times to go into like victim mode, I don't go into victim mode in the way that you think about it, which is like kind of like the the Ben way where he's like, oh, you're just being mean to me and poor me and I can't expect things. You're being just like your mom and oh, it's not that hard. I don't really do that. Um, it's more of just like, I'm a bad person and you're making me feel like a bad person and I feel like I'm a bad person so you're making me feel like I'm a bad person. It's more like that stuff with me. Even though I have some of these elements in me, Nick has never once made casual random comments about me being, being a victim to just undercut me in social interactions. Ever. He has never done it. Ever. He's never done it in public. He's never done it in small groups of friend. He's never brought it up. Even if I was literally doing that thing in a group situation, ever. If he needed to ever bring it up to me, he would always do it in private. It was always gentle and it was always caveated for the most part. Always. Just to be clear. And that doesn't mean that Nick is some beta simp. What it means is he's a really healthy partner probably more healthy and better than i deserve at times not that he says that go over there with him and start sniffing grace's panties <laughs> i'd violate you grace i mean i'm open about it i would fucking tie sniffing. you yeah i'm just sniffing him. i would tie you up violate you demolish <laughs> you in every which way i really don't care all right now grace is gonna now she smiles right she smiles when she watches this then she'll get off stream and she'll act like what do you think Oh Jesus Christ! Like yeah. Do you victim. ever? Like a do you victim. ever? Oh. Grace just needs to get on a plane. You're, you're gonna lose me. You're gonna lose me. I'm gonna leave. Okay. Because this two sucks. weeks. Look at this. She already started it. See? This sucks. This is have game. fun with men ever. Oh my God. Go over there with him and start sniffing Grace's pants. I'm just gonna rewatch that end a little bit. Oh, yeah. do you ever? Like yeah. Do you ever? Oh. Act like. What do you think? Oh Jesus Christ! Like a do you victim. ever? Like a do victim. you ever? Oh. Grace just needs to get on a plane. You're, you're gonna lose me. You're gonna lose me. I'm gonna leave. I'll get this two sucks. weeks. Look at this. She already started it. See? This I will sucks. Not this is have game. fun with men ever. Oh my god. Ah, uh, okay. Ben tells Grace, put them up against the glass for the boys, in reference to her breasts, to which she stands up so the stream can get a closer look at her chest. Garbage. Grace, we got guys it. coming over there. Put them up against the glass for the boys. Come on. The pants are now. Now, Grace has a nice Excuse body, me. but Grace doesn't use it. Grace stays in her house. Grace, to okay. get something uh, instead of like those sweatpants. I'll pants. get something other than sweatpants. I'll be right back. Okay. Yeah, please put on fishnet something uh, uh, garbage. Grace, we got guys in. coming over there. Put them up against the glass for the boys. Come on. Ben compares Grace to her mother again and says she doesn't have too much time until she's ugly like her mother, so she needs to use her looks while she has them to get more views. It. Look, I mean, poor Maxer, let's be honest, okay? She looks at her mother and goes, there's no way I'm ever going to end up like that, physically or... Uh, but it's absolutely guaranteed the way she's going. 
Now, yeah, she wants so to remain. She, that like way. her mother, has maybe five to ten years of this power that she has right now. But she thinks she's got the rest of her life and all eternity. No, no, rest, oh, no. Where, that all that these men are going to want to chisel away at this belt. It, Look, I mean, poor Maxer, let's be honest, okay? She looks at her mother and goes, there's no way I'm ever... So in case you're fresh and new to the stream, remember uh, this guy is a weird dude who puts Vaseline on his camera. I don't know why. And he says extremely inappropriate things to women all the time. Uh, this is Ben and this is Grace. Ben is uh, Grace's father. Grace does a sexy dance for the stream. Let's do a go fun. All right, I'm just gonna jump through it. It's just the dance. I'm just gonna watch for her dad saying anything. They're mostly just smiling. Let's do a GoFundMe for a specific article. Okay. All right. Um, to be fair, this clip, I've seen the full version of it. At a later point, Ben encourages Vaseline camera to put her full size so that the whole stream could see you. It was just her. And then coaches them on how to do that because boomers can't technology. So some people are going to say, I can see it now. She's an adult. She gets to choose what she does. If she didn't want to dance or do any of those things, she doesn't have to. And you are correct. And you also don't seem to understand psychological dynamics, right? The problem isn't whether or not she chose to do it. That's not the issue. The issue is a father feeling comfortable about a man making those types of comments about his daughter repeatedly. He's going to hog tire. He's going to violate her. He's going to grope her breasts. At no point was she clearly indicating that she super enjoyed that. Maybe she did. It wasn't super obvious. And it also has nothing to do with whether or not Grace signed off on any of that thing and everything to do with Ben's behavior exclusively. There is very few worlds where people are going to agree, particularly in a Christian one, that a dad should be comfortable with men gratuitously his daughter, encouraging his daughter to sexualize herself, to flaunt her, right? To, sh what did he say? Uh, put them up against the glass for the boys to try to get viewers. In fact, a lot of Christians are pretty staunchly opposed to that. And specifically, the issue isn't Grace choosing to do these things. That's fine. Grace gets to choose whatever she would like to do. The problem is the language and how he did it, the way in part, in part that he encouraged her to do it, the fact that he kept bringing up the feared thing, her being like her mother, right? We've talked in the past about how, talked in this stream about how oftentimes in toxic dynamics, people will try to weaponize the people who have hurt you most against you, particularly when they're upset with you, like saying you're being just like your mom, you're being just like your father, you're just like your older sister. Whoever that feared person is, they'll weaponize it against you. I already said, there are some pieces of advice that are good to give to other people, that are healthy to give to other people. And there are some bits of advice that are excellent pieces of advice for yourself and don't translate very well to other people. Like realizing the toxic behaviors that you do that are just like your unhealthy parent is good. It is good. And I go, oh gosh, this is an unhealthy behavior that I saw modeled in my mom. And I'm doing this thing that's just like my mom that hurt me and now is hurting others. It is not good for people in my life to go, you're being just like your mother. Particularly in situations where they're encouraging you to change your clothing, to put on more revealing clothing repeatedly, while another man is talking very simply gratuitously about her body. None of this has to do with whether or not Grace is okay with the sexy dance. And everything has to do with Ben. There's one last thing I wanted to bring up. When I randomly Googled Ben Thorpe, I came across a Kiwi Farms thread back from February where Ben seems to be trying to promote his stream. Um, I'm going to open this separately because I don't really want to pull Kiwi Farms up. Okay. 
He describes Grace as a 10 out of 10 and even talks about how he's trying to get Milo Yiannopoulos to date his daughter. That's going to be tough because Milo is not into women. Ben Thorpe will use his daughter in any way he feels will get him more views. All that I've posted above seems to explain why Grace flirts with any popular male figure that she can get into contact with. It's for her dad. Destiny has already mentioned that he's given Grace perms to his Discord. No amount of complaining is going to change that, so I don't recommend people try to do that. Personally, I don't necessarily have a problem with Grace showing up on stream. Um, okay, this is just going to be about Destiny. Uh, personally, I don't uh, have a problem with Grace showing up on stream, but I don't think we should give any attention to her father. If Grace wants to come on and talk about a specific subject, like when she went on street to debate vegan gain, I think that's fine. I think it was pretty funny, I, but I don't think it would be responsible to give her to have her on and focus on her dysfunctional family situation for an extended period of time unless the engagement is similar to Destiny's recent JCS-style interview with Grace and her father. It shouldn't be used in a joking way as promotion for her father's YouTube channel. Ben Thorpe's goal is to explore his way his family members in whatever way he can in order to get more viewers on YouTube, and I think we should be careful in accidentally playing into that. I would agree with the end statement, for sure. That Ben Thorpe's goal is to exploit his family members. I don't know if I'd use the word exploit, because Ben probably feels that it's not ex exploitation. Uh, it's them, like, working together, because I'm sure in Ben's mind, if he's successful, his family's successful, because he's the caretaker. Uh, but he is absolutely, in my mind, utilizing his family members in whatever way he can to get more viewers on YouTube. And I think we should be careful in accidentally playing into that. I thought it was really weird at the end of the debate that both Ben and Grace made a weird comment about how Steven Crowder might need a feminine presence and that if he wanted a female in his life that they could hit them up. Um, I have seen some DMs between Milo and Grace as well. Um, when I talked privately to Ben albeit once, only once. So take this with a large grain of salt. Uh, one of the things I was most surprised by was the lack of energy and personality. Now it's possible and it's because he was really tired because people get tired and then they get low energy. Um, the issue is it felt like a confirmation of a suspicion that I've had for a long time, which is that particularly in Ben's mind, a lot of what Ben is doing isn't that real. Some of it is, like the interactions probably with his family, and some of it's not. And the line that we draw between these two things isn't clear. But I think a lot of what Ben is doing is he thinks contentious and viral will get popularity, and he's leaning into that. And I think he's encouraging Grace to do a bunch of things because he says, look, Grace. And she's like, I don't know if I'm comfortable. And he probably goes, look, Grace, this will get you popular. And to some degree, he might be right. And he might be wrong. I'm going to answer Brittany. I don't know anything about this family, but what are the chances they're all toxic and lost as a whole family unit? Sounds like the blame can't be pointed in one direction. I suspect that's true. This is the problem with toxic family dynamics and something that I'm going to point out as an issue in this article. Number one, this article doesn't go into detail about Grace's treatment of her mother or Ben's treatment of their mother. Um, my understanding of the few clips that I've seen <clears throat> is that there's some really problematic stuff about Grace um, calling her mom names, being physically aggressive with her mom, pulling on her mom's hair, although that one seemed to be that one seemed to be more of an act. There's one, though, with her, like, pushing her face around that seemed a little bit more real. Um, that is super toxic as well. It's really easy to want to find one single bad guy. And the way this article is written absolutely does paint Ben as the single bad guy. The problem is that that's really hard to know. It is possible that Ben is mostly just the bad guy. That he's been psychologically and emotionally to his wife and all of his kids and he's brainwashed Grace and that's the whole story. That's possible. Unlikely, but it is possible, right? Those extreme cases do happen. They really, 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 really do. And this might be an extreme enough case that that is literally what's happening. The problem is that we have no idea what's going on with Courtney. Why is her affect so flat? Is her affect flat because of the dynamics between her and Ben? Has it always been flat? We don't really know. We also don't know Courtney's feelings on any of these situations. Why did she leave? Why does she say she's going for a new life? Is there many, any mental illness history? Because in a family unit where you have a bunch of toxic people, 
It's hard to know. The one thing I'm going to emphasize that is less easy to place blame on is kids. Now, Grace is in a tricky situation in my mind because she's an adult now. Um, I believe she's 20. But kids necessarily have less responsibility for toxic family dynamics than adults do. And most of the kids in the family are underage. And Grace is 20, but only 20, which means she's only had two years of adulthood. Um, and I think most of us know ourselves at 20, especially if we come from dysfunctional family units, aren't exactly the most like nuanced, thoughtful people. So I guess with all this, Ben looks definitely super shady. I already said my bias. I don't like Ben. He's kind of creepy. Uh, and he apparently, I now have multiple DMs of him just lying about me regularly, which is super annoying. Prefer not to be lied about all the time. Um, I don't know what on their stream is real and what's not. We all don't. We know what feels real. The problem with good actors is that's the point. Are they good actors? We have no idea. Um, we do know that there is the, uh, I believe there's some criminal history for Ben, which suggests a bit of a pattern. And the wife leaving feels like a really big commitment to an act. Um, so something unhealthy is probably going on. They are a toxic mess. Is there clear and obvious abuse going on? At times there are things that I would say, yeah, that is an instance of abuse. The issue is that a single instance of abuse doesn't actually establish an abuse pattern. Um, which I know sounds crazy because a lot of people aren't like ready for the stake. But a lot of people in their lifetime will do one, two, three, even four instances of a behavior, a single instance of it in a fight. They get really heated and explode and say something that they should have never said. Everyone's going to have those moments. And if we snapshot that moment and listen to it, everyone's going to be like, yeah, that was kind of abusive. The problem is that's not enough to establish an abusive pattern. Um, everything that this shows of the 29 hour, nine hours suggests to me some level of some emotional, no, psychological specifically, which is the framing control. I think Ayla did a really good job describing this. I think it's a really good way of understanding psychological abuse because a lot of people don't know how to separate emotional and psychological abuse, including professionals sometimes. Emotional to me and psychological abuse aren't super well separated but for me clearly something that is psychological abuse is stuff that fucks with your framework of worldview and the problem is that psychological abuse is devastatingly destructive because it changes your worldview your pillars of how you view yourself others and the world and the problem is that when you come out of spaces where frame control and psychological abuse and psychological narratives have been set for you, it's impossible to know what's true because you can't trust yourself because you don't know if that's the toxic input or a healthy input. This is why people coming out of these situations with trusted friends will constantly check with you about whether or not their feelings are valid, right? They're checking with you if they have this, this history, because they don't know, they have no idea. They're constantly like, what is real? Which of my feelings are valid? Because they've been taught to have weird, dysfunctional adjunct reactions to different things, right? They've been taught that when they feel compassion for their family, that it leads to bad outcomes for them. So maybe compassion isn't good, but they've also been taught that everything is their fault. And that it's just better to take maximal self-responsibility. And they've been taught that victims are bad, so they can never be a victim. But that's not real, right? Because people are victims sometimes, right? Like everyone is a victim, quote unquote. Er bad things happen to everyone. So of course there are times where you are legitimately kind of a victim of something. When is that? How do you know what time it is, right? We don't know. 
these answers aren't clear. And I think that's the problem with all of this is, especially on the internet, we try to talk about things like a beat and interpersonal dynamics in a way like these things are clear and they're not. Sure, we can go to the Ales thing. Uh, it's her sub stack. Here you go. I'm not going to read it all. Um, but if you just look up uh, Ayla and frame control, it'll come up. I think it's really good for characterizing this idea. A bloop, you're going to get timed out. Okay, we got to time this guy out. No, we're going to ban him. We're just going to ban him. He's banned. Okay. In my forensic work, I usually identify emotional abuse as feigning one's emotion to manipulate the other's emotions, whereas psychological abuse is creating the environment where the victim generates emotional cycle on their own. Yes. And this is why things like um, physical versus sexual versus like emotional abuse, people really don't understand psychological abuse very well. We really don't. And the way that people talk about it is so unsophisticated because when we're talking about things like sex trafficking, people are like, why don't they just leave? The people who are saying that are people who do not understand psychological abuse. They don't get it. And I'm not saying that there's clear indications of psychological abuse. It's possible that Grace is fully consenting in all of this and none of her worldview is informed by her childhood and is in no way biased by it. I don't know if I buy into that, right? Another thing that I wanted to talk about is self-loathing. I think that there's something really worth talking about in self-loathing. Self-loathing is something I've thought a lot about uh, because I've struggled with it a lot in my life. And... I've had a couple of realizations about it, which is that when people talk about self-loathing, they think of it as this like sad girl who's like really attractive and white usually. And she's like sitting in a corner. So it's like with those dark edgy like photographs where she's like sitting like this, she's like sad. And she's just like, I just wish I was beautiful. And everyone's like, what do you mean, Florence? You're gorgeous. That's what people think self-loathing is, right? But that isn't self-loathing. Self-loathing is really toxic because, and this is, this is at least what I've realized about my self-loathing. I don't know how much this is true for others. I'll talk about myself and then you guys can tell me if this maps on for you. Uh, a lot of self-loathers I've talked to have agreed with me on this, but we'll see. Self-loathing creates in you this fear monster. And the fear monster is really simple. It's just saying, what if you're bad? But what if you're bad? What if you're bad and they find out? That's all it's saying all the time, constantly. It's constantly whispering that to you. And the problem with self-loathing is that we think self-loathing looks like the sad girl crying who just needs hugs and snugs. But it's not that cute and it's not that pretty. And people who are really self-loathing aren't always self-obvious obvious that they are. Um... It's not usually the person who's like, oh man, I sure suck. A lot of those people who like talk about that, but they're being, they're not like being memey. They're being serious. Like, I know I just suck. They've mistaken like self-flagellation as self-loathing, but they're not quite there. They usually exist in this weird space between like self-pity and self-loathing. We're talking about this type of self-loathing and maybe it's all self-loathing and there's just a specific acute type of self-loathing that I'm talking about here. It's the cold type where they very rarely talk negatively about themselves unless they get really sad and upset. Most people just see them as like humble and normal and nice. And they are maximally, utterly terrified that they can't change, that they'll never be good enough, and that they'll always be a problem. Always. And they spend 90% of all of their relationships 
constantly fixated on other people, A, not finding out about their bad, whatever their bad is. It, usually their bad doesn't even exist half the time. Their bad is just their fear that people will think that they're bad. And then you'd be like, well, why do you think people are going to be bad? And it's like, I don't know. No idea. I was talking about this with Nick the other day. I'm like, what's the biggest thing I'm afraid people are going to be worried that they'll find out? Like, I don't even know the worst thing that I've done. It Because I'm super vanilla and boring. Um... I didn't realize that I had anxiety soon enough, and so I, like, uh, scapegoated my anxiety onto, like, other people. Um, not in, like, super, super abusive ways, just, like, in unhealthy ways. Um, but my, it doesn't matter, because my self-loathing monster said, I'm afraid of being bad. And when I hear Grace talk at times, I could be wrong, I could just be projecting my stuff, but I hear the self-loathing monster and the fear. She said, I'm never going to be good enough. I'm always going to be bad. And my s suspicion is that that makes her at times very resistant to criticisms. And at other times really open to criticisms, depending on where she's at with defensiveness. But a lot of times what self-loathing will look like initially is it'll come out with a high level of defensiveness. That when people come up to you and they have a very, very healthy, legitimate critique of you, You'll get super defensive because nothing can be wrong about you. Because if one thing's wrong, then everything's wrong. And it's not because you think you're perfect. It's because if you're not perfect, you're bad, right? It's a different thing. I think what often happens with like the people that get characterized as narcissists, some of them are narcissists, obviously, but I think a lot of them are people who they don't think they're perfect. They think if I'm not perfect, I'm bad, which isn't the same thing. Like not really. They're totally different. And if you think, if I'm not perfect, I'm bad, any criticism is a major threat, which means it's responded to initially with high levels of defensiveness. But if you're a self-loather with high levels of compassion, like somebody who caretakes for their family all the time, you're going to feel bad about that defensiveness over time. You're going to realize that when somebody's coming up with a reasonable critique, it's kind of sh of you to get defensive to get upset to end up with really really long-winded conversations where you're constantly like deviating and pushing away and you're going to look back at your past behavior and be like that was kind of shit. and it's going to reinforce to you i'm a shit person i'm a bad person the problem is it's not a solution because future critiques are still just as threatening and every time you react poorly to a critique you feel worse and worse and worse. So what happens, and I'm so grateful that I have really good people I'm in relationship with, is because when I move out of the defensive phase because I feel bad about it into basically the self-flagellating phase, I'm now not defending myself from anything. In fact, I'm piling it on. They're like, hey, you know, if Nick is like, hey, when you like said this, um, you know, when you did this thing, like you were not patient enough about me doing the dishes. It was like kind of frustrating. I was in the middle of things. It'd be nice to just be able to like do my leisure and then get to the dishes when it's time. And it was like kind of frustrating. But if I'm in my self-flagellating phase of the self-loathing, then it looks like you're right. And I'm so sorry. And oh my gosh. Right. And then it's the panic. And it's like, uh, not only am I bad because I was pressuring you about the dishes, but I've been bad about all these other things and this and this and this on top of it. And in all ways that I'm horrible. And the problem is, especially if you're feeling irritated with the person, it's really easy to get sucked into that because it feels good to have the person who always is defensive of any criticism suddenly accepting and admitting all their faults. It can be easy to be like, yeah, you are all these things and you're this and you're this and you're always frustrated when you do this. And remember when you didn't take criticisms well? That was pretty fucking annoying. And it'll pile on and pile on and pile on until the person is left basically fully vindicated in their self-loathing. And so they're like, I'm not self-loathing. I'm just a bad person. And that's awful. And I feel hopeless, right? And I like get to the bottom of it. And what's the worst case scenario for these types of individuals, who, by the way, the self-loathing person does lots of harm to everyone in the whole process from the defensiveness, right? 
but also later with the self-flagellating because it can get really weird where a person's like, I'm feeling frustrated about you. And they're like, great, but now we need to talk about me and my high levels of distress because your small critique that I am now accepting and taking on means that I must accept all of the self-loathing I've always and ever had. So your small critique is actually like this big and I'm overwhelmed with emotions and now I need you to caretake me, right? So it's, it's, there's a lot of toxic behaviors that come from this, from the self-loathing themselves. And the worst thing to put into a self, into that type of person's life is somebody who is willing to A, never criticize them because they'll need it because you have to be able to confront your partner. And B, somebody who in the self-flagellation stage is going to revel in it because it takes a high level of self-control when you're frustrated with your partner and they're always defensive about criticisms to not lean into the self into the the self-flagellation phase and get out all of your frustrations it's really hard not to you have to love the other person a lot not to lean into that and if i'm being honest when i look at this dynamic I don't think that Ben is a super good person for it. I suspect he's somewhat good in that he's willing to bring reasonable criticisms to people, which is why he feels like safer and that he like probably gives reasonable criticisms, whereas it sounds like the mom never does. Um, I also suspect that he's very, very willing uh, to lean into the self-flagellation. And I think that that's a really bad dynamic. Okay. Dot. All right. What the hell? That is too much even for a troll. Why he is talking with that orc maxer? Fame over family? That is excommunication case. All right. Um, for those of you asking me if I'll be bringing Ben Thorpe on, uh, I will not. He's welcome to make a response video on his own time, on his own platform. Um, I will not be bringing him on the platform um, at this point in time. Just a reminder in YouTube chat, I know it's tempting. And I know, Rennie, I am making you work for those free head pats that you get as the mod thing. The YouTube chat is not a place for you to vent all of your anger and frustration against Ben Thorpe. I'm sorry. If you think, I don't know what it is, but there's like this weird thing where it's like, I see people do this with Lav all the time too, where they're like, oh, Lav's in a chat, gotta go in there and get my kicks on. And you have to like get in there and say the same criticism that she's probably heard from 9,000 people again, so that she knows that you too think that way. You don't need to do it. If you're just antagonizing Ben Thorpe for no reason, ignore him. I appreciate you, Rinny. I'm sure you're removing a whole bunch of extremely off-color comments from Ben about Probably my sexuality. FYI, Ben is in chat, Harren. I know. Um, also, someone put me down in Thorpe is the first one to point out the parentification of Grace. Hey, nice, good job, so erudite. At Ben Thorpe, aka Abel, and at Grace Thorpe, aka Joan, are in the chat. You should bring them in, Ladybug. We won't be bringing them in. Sorry. Uh, and just so you know, Ben, um, I know you're very upset with me. Understandably, for me covering this, I don't like you. I think that you're cringe. Um, Hear me out. Ben and Mr. Girl team up. I understand that there's going to be a desire to defend yourself. You can do so. I just don't think it's going to be conducive on my platform at this point in time. Um, yeah. 
if there's a time where maybe you want me to maybe come on your platform, I will think about that for sure. Cause I understand like the ability to like respond to your own stuff. Um, I also understand why you're super angry at me and you want to say really mean and nasty things and you're totally welcome to. You can say any mean and nasty things about me that you would like. I do ask though that you try to dial down on specifically like, um, actually, you know what? Go off King. Uh, any comment you make that makes my mods feel uncomfortable though, they're totally willing uh, to block. And if you say some really, really like lascivious, inappropriate things about me, because I keep seeing you trying to make like weird comments about me which is like the weirdest go-to what's with let's what's with like old men particularly like religious old men trying to like weaponize you know like make women feel uncomfortable i mean we know what it is but um i'm impervious to your attacks if you make my mods uncomfortable they will be blocking you and i totally give my mods freedom to time out ben and if people are responding to you in my chat because you're saying horrific things um our mods will do our best, but there's an element of, like, if you keep kicking the hornet's nest. I understand that you're mad, but also, like, 